I'm going to talk today about autonomy, as you know, um, which is certainly in the running for the most vexed and multiply understood and complicated and fraught concept in bioethics, if we're just going to name one. So I have a daunting task in front of me because I'm supposed to give you something you can hold on to on a topic that is um, almost impossible to narrow down to something that we can all hold on to. And my goal today, I hate to tell you, is not to make the concept of, a con of autonomy clear and simple for you, but rather to make it messy and head scratching and complicated for you. <laughs> that really is my goal. What I'm going to try to do in the next hour is show you just how many different and competing and messy concepts of autonomy we actually have, the way that they're all doing important but different work, and the way that they're all sort of hopelessly entangled together. So if you come out of here feeling like you understand autonomy much less than when you came in, then my job will be done. Uh, I want to start with what I think is roughly the dominant caricatured picture of autonomy, let's say. Um, and I think it is both too narrow and too simple by far, but at the same time helpful and illuminating. So I'm not going to scrap it. We can think of it as kind of the backbone on which we're going to build. And it's got three elements. First of all, this is, sorry, this is in the context of medical care, of course, and we're talking specifically about patient autonomy. There's all sorts of other kinds of autonomy we could talk about. So for a patient to be autonomous, according to the dominant model in the context of medical care, we want to say that she understands her situation and her medical options. That is, she's been informed successfully. Right? She has the capacity and the skill to deliberate about those options and make a choice among them. That is to say, she's not only informed, but she's also competent. And finally, when it comes to making her choices, she makes her own decisions about her care. She's not coerced or manipulated by other people into making those decisions. Right? So she's also free, in some sense of free, to choose, free from outside pressure. And if you put those three together, informed plus competent plus free, I think we have the sort of core, most dominant picture of what it is for a patient to be autonomous in the context of medical care. In, in other words, when you put those things all together, you get roughly what we think about as inform, her having given informed consent or being capable of informed consent. Right? And so uh, if we just stick to that very dominant core picture, then we tend to think of respect for autonomy as, in the first instance, protecting or enabling patients' ability to give free, competent, informed consent. Now, you should notice right up front a few things. First of all, this model narrows in on a very specific context, right? If this is all there was to autonomy, then autonomy would only come up at the moment of choice in a clinic between various medical decisions, right? So it's looking at a very specific moment, the moment where a health professional is offering choices to a patient and the patient is deciding among them. In other words, something that happens at only a few moments in our life compared to the vast array of things that go on in our life, right? So it, it, it locks autonomy onto a very specific sort of context. Um, the other thing to notice that I'm going to sort of loop back to throughout the hour is that even in this kind of minimal dominant model, it's interesting to note that there's what philosophers would call an epistemic component to autonomy, which is to say that right from the get-go, our ability to know and to reason and to deliberate, our knowledge and reasoning skills, are essential to our autonomy, right? If you look at one and two there, you can't be autonomous unless you're informed, and also you can't be autonomous unless you are somebody who is able to deliberate about what you've been informed about, right? So there's a knowledge component right from the start, and I think that's actually interesting and important. I'm going to make that knowledge component more complicated as we go along. Now, when people think about the place of autonomy in bioethics, you tend to hear two interestingly nearly opposite concerns about the place that autonomy inhabits. And oddly, even though they're opposite concerns, I, I think they're both really um, legitimate concerns. One claim is that autonomy is routinely overemphasized in bioethics, right? That people act as though once we have informed consent taken care of, once we've protected autonomy, 
then we have kind of an, an ethical home free pass and we don't have to worry about whatever else is done. Right? So as long as somebody consented to something autonomously, then we act as though it doesn't matter what the moral complexities of what they consented to were. We've got their own autonomous choice and so it's what they wanted and so we're good. And this, people have rightly pointed out, ignores other forms of moral harm other than trespassing on people's autonomy. It ignores concerns about assaults on dignity, exploitation, unacceptable levels of physical harm, and various other kinds of harms that just aren't captured by autonomy. So one worry is that we focus too much on autonomy. At the same time, you have just as vocal a group of people saying that autonomy has been underemphasized, that autonomy in the context of medical care has been reduced to a merely formalistic, legalistic notion of informed consent, that we act as though all it means to protect autonomy is to hand somebody an 18-page single-spaced form and tell them to sign at the bottom, right? Which I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, and so the idea there is we're actually not respecting or protecting autonomy at all. We've substituted for autonomy this um, bare bureaucratic notion that has very little to do with how people actually relate to their own choices. And we think that once we have the signature at the bottom of the page, we've taken care of autonomy concerns, whereas in fact, autonomy is a, rich, excuse me, a much richer notion that requires much more than that in order for it to be protected and enabled. And I think both of those concerns are real concerns. There's a sense in which it's overemphasized and a sense in which it's underemphasized.